podcast is back in a new form. We have a video element now, which if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to, you have no idea. But if you're watching on YouTube, you do have an idea and you can see my face, which is um, unfortunate for you, but we're going to be able to put it on YouTube. So that is exciting in itself. So this past weekend, we had NASCAR all three series in Nashville uh, for a triple header, which I'm always a fan of triple headers, except for the fact that I would love to see the trucks actually go to proper short tracks, but that's a different topic for another day. And then we're obviously recording this a little bit into the week because I have a busy life. Um, obviously, some things happen this week that we'll get into that are leading into the Chicago street race. So let's just talk about what happened this past weekend in Nashville real quick. Ross Chastain finally didn't let the intrusive thoughts win, goes out, leads 99 laps, and wins the race in pretty convincing fashion, beats Martin Truex Jr., who now has six top fives in the last nine races, probably the hottest driver in the sport, uh, including two wins. He looks really good right now. I would argue that he has to be a Final Four favorite at the moment. Ross Chastain making a good, um, making a good case for himself as well going forward. I think right now you kind of have... Three guys, I think, that are pretty clear-cut, not clear-cut favorites, but have definitely set themselves ahead of the rest of the field in Kyle Larson, William Byron, and Martrex Jr. Kyle Busch is right there, maybe a step below them. And then it's kind of open up a little bit beyond that. I wouldn't put any Fords in there at the moment, but you could maybe make the argument for Logano because he never goes away. He's constantly making things happen. But really good race. Overall, National Super Speedway, I think a lot of us were skeptical when it came on to the schedule that we were like, do we really need another intermediate, especially with the NA18D package, uh, which was the old high downforce small motor package, which for some reason people on the internet actually like, which I'll never understand that. That's a different topic, though. But we had a really good race. You had side-by-side -side racing. No matter what car you put on track, you're always going to have drivers complaining about, you know, aero wash, aero push getting aero tight behind a car, dirty air, it's always going to happen. So I don't I don't put a ton of credit into uh, like what Martin said. Like, yeah, we know. I understand it. I could see it, all right? We could all see it. As soon as he got behind Ross, he would lose the front end a little bit. But that's kind of all racing in a sense, unless you like literally strip these cars down, go to spec racing, and everybody has the same exact body with no splitters, no anything. So... You can kind of toss that out to the side. Uh, it's unfortunate for Martin, but at the same time, like that's defensive driving by Ross, who was clearly using his rear view camera to match whatever Martin was doing. And Martin even said over the radio, this guy's not deciding what lane to take until he's in the middle of the corner, which was the lane that Martin was going to take. Which, again, that's what Ross has to do to win the race. We saw Joey Logano become famous for doing that. And back with the old Gen 6 car, even Kevin Harvick did it. Tons of people used to be really good at aero blocking, essentially. So I think that what we saw was a good race. Overall, like, it could have been better, maybe? But I don't know how much better you can make that, right? It's a mile and a, a third, concrete oval. It's kind of is what it is. I think it's a unique racetrack that does belong on the schedule, at least until maybe the fairgrounds comes back and NASCAR can make the short track package better, which would make the fairgrounds race better. Until then, though, I think Nashville Super Speedway is a suitable option for the Cup Series. It's in a popular tourist destination. I think it's like 15 to 17 in the most popular tourist destinations in America, which I know people are like, that's crazy. That's too low. There's a lot of popular places. Uh, I joked on, on TikTok that it was you know, the 17th most popular American tourist destination behind Knott's Berry Farm in California. And is that factually true? I don't know. Don't fact check it. Because uh, I didn't. But it could be. It's definitely behind amusement parks, like for sure. Knott's Berry Farm is kind of like a niche thing. And if you know, you know. If not, then you're probably like, that is probably not a real place. It is somehow. Either way, fans came out, right? It says Nashville. It's like Nashville adjacent. It's like... It's in the vicinity of Nashville. Um, it's in the same vicinity of Nashville as like Santa Clara is in the vicinity of San Francisco or Fontana is in the vicinity of Los Angeles. It's around. It's like 40 minutes outside of Nashville. If you've ever driven past Nashville Super Speedway, you're probably driving and you're like, is this even Nashville anymore? It is. Uh, I swung by one time to take a look at it when it was closed, and I was like, yeah, I can understand why there's not a race here anymore. Now there's a race there, and they sell the place out. 
So there's probably what, 40-ish thousand fans there in a sold out race, 40 to 45, probably. Which is funny to me that we're, there's talk of taking away Bristol's spring race because not enough fans are going. And it's just because optically it looks bad on television, but you're still having 70,000 fans buy tickets. It just looks bad when you're in a 150,000 seat stadium. 70,000 fans buying tickets is still better than almost every racetrack on the schedule at the moment. I mean, that's a plus 20,000 sellout at Phoenix. And Phoenix is constantly boasting about how they're selling out the grandstand. I believe Homestead has like 45,000. So it is funny to me when we talk about these tracks selling out, but then we then people want to mock Bristol for not selling out, but still selling more tickets than every track on the schedule. And unfortunately, a lot of these tracks, Bristol included, were built to suit this NASCAR boom, uh, which we're just never going to replicate again, right? Like, it's just not going to happen. And the Bristol Night Race is a crown jewel event at this point. That's why it draws so many fans. So it does make sense that it still exists in its current size and capacity because it does sell the Bristol Night Race out or at least close to capacity. But at the same time, like, that is a novelty event. It's like the Daytona 500. You could have 100,000 seats in Daytona because you know you're going to sell it out because it's the biggest event on the calendar. Same reason Indianapolis has 250,000 permanent seats for the Indy 500, but at the same time, you can go to like Iowa and it has 35,000 seats, which is totally fine. I, I don't get hung up on the whole seating capacity thing that a lot of people do. Oh, it doesn't have enough seats to host a cup race. Who's to say, right? I mean... North Wilkesboro doesn't exactly have a lot of seats, but it can still host a cup race. So that was a whole tangent, but we're going to get back to actually talking about Nashville real quick. Pretty uneventful race. What, four cautions, two for stages, one for Tyler Reddick losing his right rear tire, coming to pit road, coming back to pit road because he knew it was loose. I assume that his tire changer just wanted the 4th of July weekend off, so he's going to get a suspension and he won't have to go to Chicago. Uh, so if he's one of those, he doesn't have to worry about it. At the same time, it ruined Tyler Reddick's night, right? He goes two laps down and just could never recover from from there. At the same time, he wins stage one as well. Got a picture with uh, Megan Overtime. And if you know, you know. So he got he scored two wins on, uh, on Sunday night before ultimately getting stuck back mid-pack or at the back of the pack and could never make his ground back up. If you're Toyota, though, you have to be happy with how well you've ran at Nashville Super Speedway up to this point. I, I think they led like 134 laps on Sunday between three or four of their cars, but they don't have a they don't have a winner's trophy to show for it. Just like they didn't have one in 2022 or 2021 either, and they probably should have at least scored one victory by now. But instead, Chevy has swept all three races at Nashville Super Speedway up to this point, which. You know, good for them. They figured out a way to capitalize, right? They won it in uh, 2021 with Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott last year, and now Ross Chastain. And then we had, on a restart, Dr. Brad Keselowski having a little bit of a traction dysfunction there. Couldn't get the power down and ends up stacking up the field in the courting effect. And Kyle Busch goes sliding off and Ryan Blaney does as well. And Blaney, granted, he did scrub some speed, but he still hit the inside wall a ton and he hit a concrete wall. A concrete wall on the inside of the racetrack at the exit of the tri-oval. Makes absolutely no sense. And the fact that that still exists at this day in NASCAR is absolutely absurd because it's maybe, what, a 40-foot wall, if that? There's plenty of safer barrier that they could have just bought and put in there, right? Like, Kentucky has a mile and a half worth of it. Nobody's racing at Kentucky. Just go take some of that and move it down to Nashville. Uh, I don't understand what the whole point of that was. But Ryan Blaney said afterwards, I mean, he came over the radio right away and said, holy shit, I'm going to need some help. Thankfully, he seems okay, right? Like, we haven't heard any updates yet, uh, and we're midweek now after the race. He did say in his post-race, though, uh, when they interviewed him uh, outside the infield care center, that he'll pay to have the safer barrier put up right there. And it's unacceptable that we're even talking about the fact that there's not safer barrier on an oval at the exit of a tri-oval. Uh, that makes no sense. The only place like on an oval where you could get away with not having safer barrier is probably mid-corner on the inside of the racetrack, right? The chances of somebody coming down the hill and shooting off in there is just highly unlikely because you're going around the corner, your momentum's carrying you up. At no point are you going to 
come back down to the inside mid corner, but still just put it all the way around, right? Like tracks are making a ton of money through this media rights deal, at least until 2025 if teams get their choice. So either way, uh, yeah, that, that stacked up, caused a bad race for Blaney. He had an okay race going, probably had a top 10 car. Stage number two, you had Martin Trex Jr. and Denny Hamlin battling out. Hamlin picks up a stage win, and that was about the highlight of the night for, for those boys, or at least for Hamlin. And then you have Ross Chastain taking the lead, and he was able to just kind of set sail, gets the lead and holds on to it. Looked really stout. This is what Trackhouse can do. The Trackhouse builds fast race cars, right? They dipped a little bit the last few weeks. Justin Marks had to kiss the Don's ring, Rick Hendrick and ask for forgiveness. Ross had to settle down just a little bit, lay low for a minute. He's got too many people coming down on him. And now, like, nobody's trying to turn Ross into something Ross isn't, right? Like, everybody wants Ross to continue to be aggressive, but at the same time, Ross can be aggressive. He has to win races, though. And up to this point, he wasn't winning races. If he can channel his aggression and win races, nobody's going to complain. He can start running into people again as long as he's winning races. So... That was a massive win for not only him, because it's been over a year, and he's been embroiled in controversy literally since last summer, like a full year's worth of controversy. It's also a big night for Trackhouse, because they've struggled as a company up until this point, at least getting the finishes that they probably deserve. They've had fast race cars. I mean, they should have won the Spring Darlington race right this year, right? Like, it's not out of the question that they should be in victory lane. Daniel Suarez continues to struggle. Uh, which is unfortunate for him. That picture of Ross Chastain coming down pit road after qualifying and Suarez spinning out, stuck in the infield grass, was like all time. To just kind of perfectly exemplify what their season and maybe their careers at Trackhouse together have been, right? Ross keeps getting hyped up, and Daniel Suarez feels like he's been forgotten about in a sense. Having said all of that, Nashville is a bit of a home race for for Trackhouse. And if they were smart, they would have put the Tootsie sponsorship on the one car, even though I, we get it. The 99 is like the company's car, right? Uh, that was the first one. But at the same time, like, Ross has a better chance of getting to victory lane. No offense to Daniel Suarez at the moment. Just Ross is performing better. But, yeah, they desperately needed that. It's, it's good for Chevy, too, right? You're not having just... I mean, you have three teams now that have gotten you to... To victory lane this year in Hendrick, RCR, and and now Trackhouse. It's pretty stout as a manufacturer going forward. So overall, Nashville, really good race. Chase Elliott almost wrecked it coming to the white flag lap. Uh, you can see the onboard right here. I'll put it into the video. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see him get sideways, bounces off, I believe, Brennan Poole, maybe. Catches it, didn't bend it. Ends up getting a top five finish out of it. And then after the race on the cooldown lap, Chase Briscoe, who has been completely lost, completely out to lunch the last month or two, that guy, I don't know if he knows how to drive a race car anymore, for being completely honest, because he looks so bad. He's getting passed by, like, BJ McLeod and JJ Gailey are passing him on the regular. Like, he just can't even keep up with him. So I'm not sure what's going on with Chase Briscoe, but it's not going well at the moment. And for whatever reason, he was still on the track on the cooldown lap. Maybe he was just trying to finish all the laps since he was multiple laps down. And Suarez turns up to go congratulate his teammate on track, not realizing that the 14 is still on track, and turns himself off the nose of the 14, breaks that right rear toe link. He's got to hobble that car back to pit road. And Chase Briscoe's just like, man, cannot catch a break uh, at all. So, bummer for him. But... Overall, really good cup race. No complaints. I saw it had, it was the highest rated national race on Jeff Gluck's Was It a Good Race poll, which I guess I didn't, I thought we were going to start paying for polls on Twitter. Do we not have to? I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to have to look right now because Elon was like, oh, you can only do polls if you're, no, yeah, you can still do polls right here. So stupid. Um, not that anybody could just see that, but take my word for it. But, getting back to it, Xfinity Series race on Saturday, absolutely could not stop wrecking. We had multiple wrecks, started off hot with Allgaier and um, Austin Hill getting turned around. Uh, I will say this, I th that's a big fucking spider. Oh, shit. Hang on one second, guys. 
I gotta kill this spider. Oh, fuck! That son of a bitch. Where'd it go? Dude, I got an ant problem too? What the fuck? Where are these ants coming from? I don't even eat in my office. All right, fuck. Well. Bad news, spider might still be alive. So that's a, that's a crisis I'm gonna have to deal with after this. <sighs> All right, either way, back to the Xfinity race. Having now, we, we saw the Xfinity race, right? AJ Allmendinger wins the race. He has some guy named Bailey Zimmerman sponsoring the car, country music singer. I had no idea who that guy was. Apparently I might be the only one because he has like a million followers on social, which is insane. I looked at his Spotify though and I don't think I've ever heard this guy's songs. Either way, cool for him. He seemed very excited that he was on a race winning car, which is, obviously very cool. There are a ton of wrecks, so back to the wrecks. Uh, Austin Hill, I think he thinks that maybe Ty Gibbs didn't give him enough room, and uh, that's the reason he spun out at the start of the race, and then later in the race, he restarts on old tires, and that was a pretty good excuse for him to push up and spin it, spin out Ty Gibbs, who did collect the 10 car of AJ Allmendinger in that wreck. Allmendinger suffered some damage, which probably helped him out a lot in terms of aero efficiency on the right side of that car because he was able to create a ton of side force with that flared out quarter. But back to Austin Hill, I, I don't, I'm not going to say he wrecked Ty Gibbs on purpose. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he washed up and collected Ty Gibbs. His teammate though, Sheldon Creed, did get a $25,000 fine and 25 point penalty for intentionally wrecking Sammy Smith later in the race. Which, when you watched it, it just looked like a racing incident. Even Sammy Smith, after the race, in, uh, or after the wreck at the Infield Care Center, said, yeah, I thought it was just a racing incident. And then you hear over the radio that Sheldon Creed said he's going to go out there and wreck him. And you can't do that. Why is this thing flashing at me? And you just can't do that, right? So, yeah, bummer for Sheldon Creed and everybody on his team that he got caught for doing it. But at the same time, like, haven't we learned our lesson to not say things over the radio yet? I thought that uh, I thought that we had just learned that lesson up to this point. So unfortunately, he uh, got a nice fine um, because he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. And if he didn't say anything, nobody's the wiser. So he probably just skates with it and he gets to have that internal like, haha, I got him back type of feeling. Either way, didn't happen. Chad Chastain had to bring out the caution late and make make AJ Allmendinger earn it there at the end, which was hilarious because AJ and the college team were very aware of uh, maybe AJ's struggles with having to deal with the, a Chastain late in races, uh, especially in the Xfinity series. But it was a overall entertaining race. It just and normally Xfinity like delves into chaos at the end of the race. This week, it started at the beginning of the race, and I don't know. I honestly don't know why. Nashville is a hard track, obviously, to 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 race on. We saw cup guys spin out multiple times. We saw people spin out qualifying and practice. The race wasn't actually that bad. And Xfinity guys, I, I mean, I know the Xfinity cars are harder to drive, but man, they were all over the place on Sunday. I'm going to get the racing reference pulled up here real quick so I can uh, sound like an educated person uh, because at this point I haven't really given anybody any stats, right? Yeah, AJ Allmendinger wins Riley Herps. I have to laugh about this real quick because the broadcast was like, oh, don't let Riley sniff Herps. <laughs> don't let Riley Herps sniff the lead because he's willing to go for it. Riley Herps never sniffed the lead. The only time he sniffed the lead was on that late race restart when he ends up finishing second. So, Whatever. Sam Mayer goes from 34th to 3rd. Good run by him. Austin Hill recovers to finish 4th. Josh Berry, 5th. John Hunter Nuchek, 6th. Zane Smith driving the 28 car for the Siegs, which was dropped off by the Stuart Haas boys. Finishes 7th. Daniel Hemrick, 8th. Cole Custer, 9th. Cole Custer had a really good car. Uh, faded late. Parker Retzlaff finishes 10th. Uh, yeah, overall, like, it was an okay, uh, okay race. Sammy Smith obviously wrecked out. Connor Mozak continues to be an absolute weapon out there. And the unfortunate part is Connor Mozak ended Greg Van Al's ARCA championship bid because he just can't control a race car. 
He then goes and wrecks. All he does is wreck. He's spun out in practice. He wrecks during the race. He's now getting into... But unfortunately for the rest of the field, Connor Mozak is getting into a faster race car for three races this year at JGR in the number 19 car, which has already won a race uh, this year with Ryan Truex. And now he's going to go faster, which is scary for everybody else that is on the racetrack. Going over to the Truck Series race, let's recap that real quick. Carson Hosevar picked up his second win of the season. Dale Jr. had really good things to say about him during the Xfinity broadcast, especially the practice session. So maybe he's in play at JRM, right, to replace Josh Berry. We'll wait and see on that. But he ends up winning the Truck Series race, uh, which is good for him because he didn't drive through somebody. So he took a break. He's finally taking a break from hooking people on the right rear and turning them head on into the wall to channel that energy into winning races. He also had a very funny clip uh, talking about his girlfriend, which unintentionally funny. Maybe I'll put it in here as well. But good to see him finally channeling that energy and winning races because I think we all knew that he had the ability to do that. It was just taking him a long time to finally figure it out. And maybe now Fox can stop trying to cover up his past transgressions uh, by being like, oh, he's a funny hat guy, like Turd Ferguson. Big hat, funny. Except it's not when it's Carson Hosevar. So... Overall, truck race was pretty good as well. You had Haley Deegan and Lawless Allen round two. Last year, they got into it at Martinsville. This year, they got into it at Nashville, not together, but through the media, which is funny. Maybe we'll have the trilogy in 2024 pending funding, of course, for both of them, if we're being honest. Neither one of them are good, so to have them both complaining about each other is actually funny because I don't know which side fans are on. I will say this, Haley Deegan used to have this huge following, right? Because she's an attractive girl, so she got all the creeps that would follow her. She picked up all the Danica fans, basically. Uh, but now, going through my comment section on that video, I did about the two of them. I I don't know if she's got any fans left. There's still some creeps in there, but man, a lot of people are just like, Danica 2.0, Danica Deegan, Danica Deegan, which is kind of funny. But yeah, I mean, she's not good. Unfortunately, Ford, it, when Ford stops paying for that, she's out. She's going to go do some dirt racing, off-road racing or whatever uh, it is that she does. But, yeah, very um, very funny that they continue to run into each other and, and want to complain about each other battling for 23rd place in a truck series field where the talent level is really not that great uh, this year. So, yeah, we'll see what happens when they get back to to the track. They're at mid-Ohio week and a half from now. Uh, July, what, 8th, I believe, maybe, somewhere in there. Either way, solid weekend of racing at Nashville. We also had some news come out this week as we head into Chicago. Chicago street course will be ready. Uh, I, it's closed. It's going to be closed. They're not going to get done setting up until Friday night, late into the evening on Friday night when they finally shut down Michigan Avenue. So if you follow NASCAR Chicago, I believe it's NASCAR Chicago, on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, you can see uh, they've posted some videos and pictures of the circuit being built. Looks great. I mean, it looks like a street course, right? It's signage is going up, stands are there. There are still tickets available for both uh, Paddock Club and for reserved uh, seating. Not sure how many tickets are left, but NASCAR did say like 70% of the fans going are going to their first ever NASCAR race, I think is what I saw uh, Adam Stern tweet out, which is, that's why they're doing this. They're not they're not doing street races because they necessarily think it's going to be a great on-track product. Like, that's obviously the end goal is like you would love to have that. But at the same time, they couldn't get fans to go out to Joliet, right? And ironically, I think we all know that Chicago Lane would probably put on a really good race with the next gen car. It, that's just not happening right now. It's too far away from the city. It's like an hour drive. It's hard to get people to go out there. Putting the race in downtown Chicago takes the race to a whole group of people that likely were never going to go to a NASCAR race, which is the whole point of this. And then you put this race on the doorstep of multiple Fortune 500 companies. McDonald's is headquartered in Chicago. There's a reason McDonald's is the presenting sponsor of this race, and you're going to see their signage everywhere. They're sponsoring Bubba's Block Party. They're sponsoring a number of other things throughout this week because NASCAR took this event to them, basically. It's the same reason that, like, 
the Xfinity Series race on the road course at Indianapolis for Lily for the longest time. Same reason the Xfinity Series went to Mid-Ohio so Nationwide could have their home race because they're based out of Columbus. They're now doing this. NASCAR is paying attention to where their big partners are or potential big partners are, and that's the whole point of taking this race to downtown. If the race is good, that's just an added bonus. Obviously, we've seen some drivers. Kyle Busch thinks every corner is going to be like Indianapolis. I think you're going to get some crazy you know, restarts, crazy start maybe, but I think it's going to get pretty strung out, and we'll see what happens after that. But this race isn't about the racing so far this this year, at least in not its first edition. And we'll see what happens if it comes back next year. I honestly didn't think it would be back for year two, but it sounds like it's going to be. Uh, it sounds like the mayor, the new mayor, uh, the one that didn't sign this deal, Lori Lightfoot signed this deal and was like, deuces. But uh, Brandon Johnson, I believe is his name, he definitely changed his tune because I think he sees how big this event is going to be. You did it... You, <laughs> There's a journalist in the Chicago Sun-Times who wrote one of the worst articles you've ever, opinion pieces on NASCAR you've ever seen. Starts off hot with like people pay for that, uh, referring to NASCAR fans paying to go to a NASCAR race, a major sporting event, which is like asking people why they would pay to go watch the Cubs or the White Sox or something like that. He then compared NASCAR street race to, uh, he thought it'd be a lot like the Chicago Marathon where you could hop off the train, walk down some local street so you know he's one of them, one of the local guys. I, I have no idea what street it was and go watch the cars, as he says, go vroom, vroom, bye, and then get bored with it, and go grab some lunch. Not real, and then he went to the ticket website and saw that you had to pay to watch this race. Again, a major sporting event. I don't think, I don't think Neil Steinberg from the Times, Sun Times, understands how marathons work, or how business in general works. Marathons are generally ran by thousands of people who all pay an entrance fee, and that money from that entrance fee goes into the infrastructure of the event. The emergency workers, the road closures, the, the, tra the course build-out, everything involved. Same thing with a NASCAR race, except it's not the competitors paying, uh, it's the fans paying this time. So it's a little bit of a reversal, but still the same principle when it comes down to the finances of it. They pay for a ticket, which then in return pays for the course setup, the emergency services, and all the road closures and everything that goes along with that. Neil could not get that at all. So hopefully he comes to the race and maybe can understand it. And we'll see what happens. But I'm excited. I'm going into the Chicago street race with an open mind. I was maybe a little bit uh, turned off by it at first. I think it's going to be good. I hope it's going to be good, at least. And we'll see what happens, I guess. Also, some other news, un unfortunate news broke uh, on Tuesday that Jimmy Johnson's wife's parents were involved in a murder-suicide that also took the life of their 11-year-old grandson as well, Jimmy Johnson and his wife Chandra's nephew. So, um, yeah, Jimmy's wife, uh, Chandra, her parents still live in Oklahoma where she's from, Muskogee, I believe. Uh, Oklahoma police received a call from a, what they said was a woman saying that there's somebody in the house with a gun. When police showed up, they found her father, Jack, uh, deceased with uh, inside the door. They found the body of the 11-year-old, and then they heard a gunshot upon arrival, which was apparently the mother. This is all according to what authorities said. So, devastating situation for not only... Uh, Chandra, Chandra Johnson, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, uh, but Jimmy as well, because like obviously it's his in-laws, super traumatic experience, I can't imagine trying to process all of that and deal with it, so Jimmy was supposed to make one of his select starts this year for Legacy Motor Club, the team obviously that he co-owns, in that 84 car, Legacy announced on Tuesday that they were withdrawing that car from this weekend's race for obvious reasons, because Jimmy's Energy and time needs to be focused on things that actually matter. So, really devastating situation for for them as a family, and yeah, unfortunate situation. So, we're down to 37 cars this weekend, which is a weird transition now, but you have Shane Van Gisbergen in the 91 car for Trackhouse Racing, and you have Jensen Button in the 15 this weekend for Rick Ware Racing, which I think we all know is probably an SHR uh, supplied car. We'll see what happens. I'm interested to see how Chicago goes this weekend. Cars hit the track at 11 Eastern on Saturday morning for Xfinity first practice. 
Xfinity race goes green a little after 5 o'clock, and a cup race goes green a little after 5.30 on uh, Sunday. So, we'll see what happens. We have Formula 1 back in action this weekend as well. In Austria, it's a sprint race weekend, so you have qualifying on Friday, sprint race on Saturday, full race on Sunday, and you also have the IndyCar series uh, at Mid-Ohio this weekend as well on Sunday. So, packed out racing week, pack out, packed out weekend of racing. Man, all over the place there. To close the uh, podcast now, we're, I, I don't know if you guys have ever played Sporkle before, but we're going to do a little Sporkle action here to, um, to, to finish this off. So we'll do that. All right, guys, to end off the podcast, I think we're going to do a Sporkle. We're going to try this out every week. This is six minutes. It's all NASCAR points winners from the 2000s, all the point race winners from the 2000s, 2000 to 2009, six minutes, 151 answers. Obviously, when you type in one name like Jeff Gordon, that spider's back. That, uh, you type in Jeff Gordon one time, it fills him in for all of them. So let's get after it. We're going to knock this out so quickly. Starting off, Jeff Gordon makes the most sense. Jimmy Johnson won a ton of race in the 2000s. Kevin Harvick, Carl Edwards, Mark Martin, Matt Kenseth, Greg Biffle. Oh. Casey Kane had some runs there. Bill Elliott. Just worked through teams at this point, right? Terry Labonte. This is a sneaky one. People don't realize. 2003. Dar uh, Darlington. Dale Jarrett's definitely on this list. Um, Elliott Sadler. I know he won a few times. Dale Earnhardt. And Dale Earnhardt Jr., all right, we got Dale, uh, Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart having six wins in 2000, like, just doesn't get talked about enough. All right, Tony Stewart, Bobby Labonte, Denny Hamlin is on this list. 2003, Kurt Busch is on this list. Kyle Busch is on this list. Uh, Ryan Newman, Rocket Man, Ryan Newman. He definitely had eight wins in 2003. Knew that right off the head. Johnny Benson is on this list one time. Uh, Casey Mears is on this list. Brian Vickers. Can never forget him. All right. Now we got to get into it here. Did I already use Mark Martin? I did. Mark Martin, Greg Biffle, Rusty Wallace. You throw him in. Because we know he's a, uh, a multiple-time race winner. Jerry Nadeau. A-E-U? E-A-U? There we go. Joe Nemechek. Sometimes the spelling just doesn't work. Ricky Craven is on this list. Have you ever? No, I've never. All right, now we got to get into into the the nitty gritty, as they say. Did I use Ricky Rudd already? Nope. Now I have though. All right, we also have Brad Keselowski's on this list. Joey Logano, two thousand and nine. Don't forget, he's on this list. Jamie McMurray, Sterling Marlin. All right, 127 of 151. Michael Waltrip. Steve Park. Juan Pablo Montoya. All right, got 133 of 151. We are missing some multiple time race winners. Let's go through the list here off the top of our heads, all right? We already got Dale Jr. We already got Kyle Busch, Mark Martin. Um, got Brian Vickers, Clint Boyer. Martin Truex Jr. All right, so 136 now of 151. 2009, who else am I supposed David Rudiman. Yes, 2009, done. All right, 2008. 
We have Did I use Denny Hamlin? Pretty sure I already put him in here. Somebody's screaming at me right now. And I've used both Kurt Bush and Kyle Bush. Both of them have been used. Somebody had four wins in 2000. I gotta get I gotta rack my brain for this. We had Terry Labonte, we had Johnny Benson, we had I don't know why those are the first two that came to mind um, for me. Matt Kenseth already taken care of. Greg Biffle. Jeff Burton. Have I used? No, we got Ward Burton. And we have Jeff Burton. Okay, that was the four winner from 2000. Nailed that one down. Okay. We're getting down. We're getting down low right here. Down to 100, and we got six more to go. We filled out 2009, 2008, 2007, six. All right, 2005 has one, 2004 has one, and oh, 2003 has two. Who the heck could that possibly be in 2003? Michael Waltrip, we already put him down. We know he's got the win right there. Oh my gosh, you guys. I'm trying to think. Um... Bobby Hamilton, there's another one. That's a pool. That's a pool right there. Uh, am I only going to get 146 out of 151? I know somebody's screaming at me right now, and I'm sorry. I just cannot remember for the life of me at the moment uh, who's doing what, especially in 2004. It was so long ago, guys. It's 19, 20 years ago that I'm trying to rack my brain for. I usually remember a lot of things, but when you put me under pressure like this, this is so difficult. Oh, no. I wanted to get 151. I only got 146. I don't think I'm going to get anything more. Ward Burton, Jeff Burton. I know it's going to be something where I'm like, damn it. Jeremy Mayfield, no! And Robbie Gordon. Oh, no. Those are the only ones. Scroll down. What are we doing? Why won't this scroll down? Hello. All right, so that went better than I expected. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog. You can also check out the store. There's a few t-shirts up in there. Oh, I did also, I forgot these are right here. Got koozies in now. So I don't know if those are actually gonna be available. I got a lot of them, if we're being honest. Like there's a solid box here. Not sure if I'm going to put those up for sale yet. If not, I will be taking some to races. So if you guys are going to any races this summer that I'm at, uh, let me know. I'll bring a couple extra along and pass out a few and go from there.